Hi everybody, welcome to Elementary Classical Mechanics, the subject where observing the universe suggests new mathematical and computational approaches that can literally transform our way of modeling and predicting any aspect of the world. Welcome back to the second lecture of chapter 11. And in this lecture, we're going to derive equations of motion for a particle of constant mass m in a central force field. OK, remember in the last lecture, we said that a particle of constant mass m moving under the action of a central force, as defined in the last lecture, must lie in a plane because of angular momentum conservation. We're going to take that plane to be the xy plane. and we're going to use polar coordinates in the plane that we derived earlier. We learned how to differentiate the unit vectors associated with this and compute the velocity and the acceleration in the polar coordinate system. Because unlike the ij unit vectors, r and theta, r1 and theta1 do change in time, their direction, but not their length. OK. So we want to compute F equals MA. So F is a force. We know what the force is. It only has a component in the radial direction, R direction, along the position vector. OK. And in the R1, theta1 coordinate system, we've computed the acceleration. So MA equals F. These are Newton's equations. Now, we can write down each component separately, the R1 component and the theta1 component. And I've done that here. And we get equations of motion that are more complicated than anything we've seen so far because they are two second-order differential equations for two variables, r and theta, and they're coupled. That is, this equation depends upon r and theta, and this equation depends upon r and theta. But we're going to see something very nice occur. This extra constant of the motion, we haven't shown that energy is conserved yet. We're coming to that. But angular momentum being constant is going to allow us to simplify the equation's motion. So let's look at this equation. And let's multiply it by r over r, 1, this, the famous mathematician's trick. If we multiply it by r over r, we get m over r multiplying this term. And now the m over r still stays the same. But this term here happens to be the same as d by dt of r squared theta dot. And this is equal to 0 from the equations of motion. This means r squared theta dot is constant in time. We'll call that constant lowercase h. And this is starting to look a lot like an angular momentum. Remember, angular momentum about the origin for this particle of constant mass m is r cross p. So this is r times r theta dot. And if m were multiplying it, which we've taken that out up here, we would have that. And it's just a constant. But now, look how useful this would be. Because this constant of the motion enables us to write theta dot in terms of r squared, or vice versa. So in this equation, for example, we could write theta dot in terms of h over r squared, put it in there, we'd have just a, an equation for r. If we could solve that, we could come back to this, plug the solution for r in, in just r as a function of t, and we could integrate to get theta as a function of t. Now we're going to spend a little more time on this type of idea, but this is a good place to stop, and this is related to the form of the central force and conservation of angular momentum. OK, that's it for now. See you next time, where we're going to prove the uh, law of areas, the equal area law. That
strange third property when I was giving the properties of Central Force. So bye for now.